Hello and welcome, I'm Ali Mustafa and this is Straight Talk. The fight for Afrin, Turkey prepares to face off with the YPG terror group in its northern Syrian stronghold. Plus, a look at rebuilding an entire town destroyed by the PKK in southeastern Turkey. And after a tumultuous year for Donald Trump, we hit the streets of Istanbul to ask Turks what they think of the controversial American president. After months of warnings, Turkey's State Security Council has backed a military offensive against the PKK-linked YPG terror group in Syria's Afrin region. Hundreds of Turkish troops supported by armored vehicles and heavy weaponry entered the region Friday in preparation for an operation Ankara says will purge terror. Since 2014, Afrin has been under the control of YPG militants who are part of a U.S.-led coalition fighting Daesh. The YPG is linked to the PKK terror group, which has fought a decades-long war against Turkey, killing at least 40,000 people. Turkey says the Afrin offensive is an extension of the 2016 Operation Euphrates Shield, which rooted out Daesh from northern Syria. All this is coming just days after the U.S. announced plans to establish a 30,000-strong border security force in Syria with the involvement of the YPG. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan condemned the move. Şimdi artık Amerika ülkemiz sınırları boyunca bir terör ordusunu kurduğunu ikrar etmiştir. Bize düşen de bu terör ordusunu daha doğmadan boğmaktır. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson tried to clarify the U.S. position, insisting that news of the U.S. building a new Syrian army were untrue. So why is the YPG such a big threat for Turkey and why, more importantly, does the U.S. keep on disregarding its NATO allies' concerns? To answer these questions, I'm joined in the studio by Yasser Tabara. He's a board member of uh, Omran Center for Strategic Studies, which publishes analysis on political, humanitarian, social and military situation in Syria. We also have Dr. Murat Aslan, who is a lecturer of security studies at Hassan Karl Yonju University. Thank you both for being here. Let's begin with you. That question, why does the U.S. keep disregarding Turkish concerns with this new 30,000 force, which now they're saying are untrue, reports of it are untrue? Well, I think the American strategy, the U.S. strategy in Syria has uh, been inconsistent or lacking in, in, in comprehension, uh, to say the least. Uh, you cannot establish a, a certain security architecture by dissolving another. Uh, you cannot meet a security threat, as they say, which is Daesh and uh, extremists in this area, northeast Syria, by creating a bigger security issue and by agitating uh, one of your allies in the region and creating these um, major uh, issues, uh, dishevelment. Um, we're talking about um, Iraq, Iran, um, Turkey, uh, and the situation in Syria. Let's speak, look at specifically what Rex Tillerson said. He said, some people misspoke. We are not creating a border security force at all. I think it's unfortunate that comments made by some left that impression. That is not what we're doing. Dr. Aslan, what, why is there a disconnect, first of all, in the Americans? And why are Turks so concerned about the YPG? Well, uh, the most important issue is the legalization of PKK and its, su its sub-branches, PYD mainly. Because if you legalize PYD with a certain area and also certain organization fully equipped with weapons, that means in the near term they can also try to attempt uh, another or any other uh, attack towards Turkey by different methodologies, asymmetrically. And the second issue, Turkey has experienced a long history of terrorism and lost almost 40,000 people. And think that this is 20 times more than 9-11 of the United States. And Turkey does not want to experience such a terrorist organization and acts in the future. But 
after establishing PYD as a legalized entity at the southern border of Turkey, that means we will face the same thing and with an increasing trend of attacks. So, so the Turkish uh, concern is that because there's a Turkish uh, Kurdish issue inside Turkey with the PKK being very active, if there is a corridor to the south in Syria, that will be a big security threat, wouldn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. No country in the world does not want any type of formation beside their border. Think that there's a group of terrorist organizations at the north of Mexico targeting United States. It's impossible. Nobody will accept it. The Americans are one part of it, and their patronage means a lot to the YPG as well. But there's another element to this as well, right, Yasser, the Russians. And we've seen uh, the Turkish uh, chief, of, uh, chief of general staff, Hulusi Akar, in Russia trying to negotiate, maybe talk to the Russians, because the Russians have observers in Afrin. Tell us the importance of the Russians in all of this. Well, I mean, one of the reasons for this American move is to uh, try to... Uh, keep the uh, the American investment or American presence in, in Syria uh, to counter the, the Russian investment or the Russian presence that has uh, uh, taken place over the past, specifically over the past uh, three years in Syria when the Russians decided to uh, militarily intervene in, in, inside Syria and establish military bases and um, uh, support the, the Syrian regime. And so all of this, I think, um, uh, is, is, is part of the equation of, of balance. So, so, so let's, let's break it down, right? So you've got this area, Afrin, uh, you know, uh, occupied by YPG, but surrounded, in essence, by uh, Syrian rebel forces, loyal to the Turks. The Tur Turkey has a military in Idlib on one side. It's got its military on the Azaz side as well. Troops amassing there and, of course, Turkish troops inside Turkey. So it's almost surrounded by three sides. But there's a little inlet there of Syrian regime forces. Is there a possibility the YPG, uh, in talks with the Russians, might allow the regime to come in? And if such a scenario does happen, what happens then to Turkey's interest, for example, Dr. Aslan? If the, if the regime takes over Afrin? Well, the issue for Turkey is to clean up the region, Afrin, from the terrorist organizations, networks. So if the Syrian regime occupies Afrin, it will be okay for Turkey? I think it will be a kind of discussion in the minds of politics. That's true. But our main target, ultimate goal, is to clean up the region. Because in the near term, uh, PKK attacked Turkish military bases uh, mainly by the units uh, based in Afrin. And we had lost soldiers. And if you go, uh, go and check the geography, they can easily infiltrate Turkey from the Amanos Mountains, uh, hit a base or any target, and go back. That means regime's presence in Afrin will not make any sense for Turks. We're talking about all, you know, chunks of a country being divided up in these uh, realms of influence, Turkey, Russia, Iran, regime, the Americans. Talk about the situation on the ground in these areas. You've got a huge chunk, apart from Afrin, that is occupied or controlled now by the YPG, including Raqqa, the former Daesh capital, where they raised a picture of Abdullah Ojalan as well. The YPG did. You've got another chunk that is controlled by Syrian rebel forces. The regime has made advances. Daesh is still there in, in pockets. The Russians are there. The, Lay, us, lay out what it's like right now in northern Syria. Well, I, I think that is the crux of the, the, the issue right now, is that um, all strategies are focusing on still uh, dividing and, and, and, and, and controlling these, these chunks of influence in Syria in order for them to uh, arrive at some uh, form of, uh, uh, of fantastical uh, uh, moment where they have a political uh, s solution. Um, and, and, and in my opinion, that is putting the, the cart before the horse. Um, one needs to look at the situation on the ground, uh, see what it, it's all about, um, you know, find out that the situation... But I'm trying to get as the end game. I'm talking about the end game. What does the Syria look like a year from now? Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to say. And, and part of the reason is these, uh, the, these, these uh, uh, military uh, incursions that are, that are taking place by, by all sorts of parties that are trying to establish their levels of influence on the ground. Uh, as we saw in Raqqa, for example, 
uh, we, we still see a, a, a population that is, that is be being controlled by an occupying force. Um, that is not going to go anywhere in the direction of peace or, or, or, or, or, uh, uh, or tranquility um, or stability anytime soon, until and unless we realize and recognize that we need a comprehensive strategy that uh, bring people on back to the table the Russians need what to influence. Strategy? What well, strategy? Well, the Russians need to, the Russians Assad need to, is still there. The Russians need to influence their their clients, uh, Assad, um, and uh, and and other parties need to uh, basically find a, a reason and um, a a a way back to the negotiating table and have uh, and and restart the negotiating process. The Russians are trying to push the Sochi uh, track, for example, which is their uh, vision of what Syria should look like. Um, and, and that's just not going to happen. The Americans are sending a very clear message, for example, by uh, making the announcement in, in, in eastern Euphrates. The, the Turks are sending another strong message by, uh, you know, uh, uh, uh, uh, coming into Afrin. Uh, so it's clear that people or, or, or uh, parties with influence, with military influence on the ground, are not happy with the Russians pushing uh, the, the, the Sochi uh, the Sochi track, and they want to put Russia in check to bring it back to the uh, y United Nations sanction, uh, sanctioned uh, uh, track of, of, of Geneva. Thank you so much, Dr. Murad Aslan and Yasser Tabar. <music> Turkey's historic Sur district is famed for its numerous UNESCO World Heritage Sites that date back thousands of years. But in 2015, the region became a front line in a war between Turkey and the PKK terror group. 60% of Sur was destroyed, forcing thousands to flee. But now the Turkish government is trying to rebuild Sur district and bring back life to a place that was once teeming with tourists. Straight Talk's Courtney Keeley went to Sur to see firsthand how rebuilding efforts are going in the second part of our special Turkey's War on the PKK. The decimated old city of Sur in Diyarbakir, with its ancient city wall, lies along the Tigris River. Bullet-ridden houses are cordoned off by police, some slated for demolition, others for rebuilding. More than 22,000 mainly Kurdish residents fled the fighting in 2016 between the Turkish military and PKK militants. The ghosts still linger. Nearly 5,000 families used to live here, multi-generations, grandparents and their kids and their kids. It was a vibrant neighborhood with beautiful old buildings, with incredibly old ancient details. And now that's all gone. The brutal conflict destroyed much of this UNESCO World Heritage Site's centuries old churches, mosques and markets. Shehuz Uzdemir, an on-site construction manager, is overseeing the rebuilding. When we first entered here, there were a lot of buildings, yet they were destroyed and burned because of the clashes. When the cleaning started, we found many bombs. Security forces safely detonated and cleared them. Now we are doing restoration work, and we are in charge of seven to eight projects. Over there is the Shahzadalar mansion. The restoration of one section is done, and the other section is still under construction. These buildings belong to the Ministry of Environment and Urban Planning. They are drawing up the plans for these projects. Once that is done, the restoration will begin. The Turkish government is building housing for displaced residents who have temporary rent-free housing available or a choice of a monthly subsidy of 1,000 Turkish lira, about $260. The housing inside SOAR is extremely limited and almost all the units are located elsewhere. Vahab Joshkin, an assistant professor at the University of Dikli's Law School, says Sur is the heart of Diyarbakir, and both residents and government authorities need to protect its historical heritage. This cannot be taken simply as an urban rehabilitation plan. This is about showing respect to the history, the culture, and the identity of the city. Is the Turkish government doing enough to rebuild Sur, to kind of reestablish the life that was there before this war? There has been criticism that the reconstruction plan could ruin the texture of Sur, especially with the loss of historical Diyarbakir houses. There has also been criticism that the compensation remains inadequate, 
I believe we will have more clarity in regards to the rebuilding in a year. The most important thing here is to finish as soon as possible to erase the bad memories of the clashes. The fighting erupted in Soar after the peace process broke down two and a half years ago. After PKK attacks on Turkish forces and civilians, including the downing of a Turkish helicopter and suicide bombings that killed at least 66 people, the Turkish military responded with airstrikes on PKK positions in northern Iraq. The conflict evolved back to the 1990s, but with a key difference. The PKK, employing tactics inspired by their affiliates in northern Syria, took over Sur, booby-trapped houses, and waged urban warfare. We couldn't even visit our loved ones in the cemetery for months. We were terrified by the sound of bombs and firing. We couldn't come here due to the clashes. Now the sounds of bulldozers and construction crews echo through this neighborhood's skeletal remains with hopes that this ancient old city can be brought back to life. Courtney Keeley, Straight Talk. Now I travel to Sur district in Diyarbakir to meet with Mehmet Ozhaseki. He's Turkey's Minister of Environment and Urban Planning. How much pressure is there on your ministry specifically and the Turkish government to ensure that Sur is reconstructed after it was destroyed, not only to local expectations, but UNESCO World Heritage Site standards? As we all know, a couple of years ago, the PKK terrorist organization turned a couple of locations inside Turkey into their headquarters. Intense fighting took place in those places where the PKK dug ditches to stop security forces and they attempted to declare independence. Local civilians were restrained by the PKK and their homes were occupied and destroyed by members of the terror group. The PKK specifically targeted the historical buildings inside Sur district and used those buildings as their warehouses before setting them on fire. The PKK damaged and destroyed the historical sites. In order to restore them, we have taken some measures. We have made an action plan under my ministry. Sur district has a special status due to its ancient history. Diyarbakir has a history spanning thousands of years. It is ancient, home to 33 different civilizations. There are more than 1,200 registered artifacts inside Sur. Diyarbakir Fortress and the Hevsel Gardens are on the UNESCO World Heritage List. So we have taken every step with the utmost care. Of course it is necessary to bring relief to citizens. It is necessary to provide housing to people who lost their homes. Yet we have to do everything right here in order to not betray its historical heritage. So we are meticulous. We take every action according to the conservation master plan. On the one hand, we are restoring historical buildings, including inns, mosques, Turkish baths, churches, synagogues and fountains. We are restoring all of them. On the other hand, we are rebuilding windows on local storefronts to boost commercial activity in the downtown area. And also, we are rebuilding the traditional style Diyarbakir homes inside the old town's neighborhoods. We won't build concrete multi-floor blocks there. You're saying it's, uh, this is a very important and very historic district and reconstructing it along Historic lines is very important for this government. 22,000 people had to leave Sur uh, two years ago when the PKK set up barricades around this area. Many, many of this, these people are still living outside, haven't been resettled properly. They say the government has given them money, but they say it isn't enough to buy property again in Sur once it is redeveloped. Sur uh, is well, there are almost 4,000 families who have lost their homes in Sur. We are offering a variety of choices to the citizens. Firstly, if they want to receive the equivalent cash value of their destroyed homes, the ministry will pay them. People can appeal to the courthouse for an investigation if they are not happy with what they were paid. The second option is the ministry has a housing project in a different part of the city. The blocks have been completed 
So upon their request, people can move into those apartments. And another one is, if people want to build their own homes in its old location, especially inside Sur, we will also support them. But Minister, you know how hard it is, especially in a place like this, which has so much history behind it, how hard it is for people to just let go and move. They have certain expectations, don't they, from your government? Tabi. Of course, Sur is a place with the highest significance, as I mentioned before. It has a tradition spanning centuries. We are talking about an ancient area. It has very important registered artifacts. Indeed, the people living here are the heirs of those ancient civilizations. All of their memories belong here their fathers, their grandfathers, their roots. Therefore, we are talking about hundreds of years of life experiences. So it wouldn't be right to tell them to adopt a new life outside this area. In this regard, we are offering different options to them to be able to make them stay here. In this regard, we are offering different options to them to allow them to stay here. One of the most important projects is to build Diyarbakir-style homes inside traditional neighborhoods. We will have a groundbreaking ceremony a month later, and our president will also join us. We will finish the construction of 1,000 homes in a year. Our priority is to enable locals to move into those traditional-style homes. We want life to continue in those neighborhoods. We want to boost local businesses. We want to revive this ancient part of the city. I guess the question is that why did it take the government so long to rebuild these areas? Why did it take the government so long and in fact the destruction of 60% of Sur to finally then put money to redevelop these areas? Some mistakes could have happened in the past. It is necessary to accept that and to be honest. Yet for the last 15 years, the AK Party government has been in charge. Under the leadership of President Erdogan, the AK Party has set out with a motto to provide for all of the country. And as a result, this part of the country has been given special attention. This region suffered under enormous pressure. The government has removed that situation. People have regained their rights and a process of development has begun. The government has taken action to boost investments. The region is being designed to be a commercial destination. The people are also aware of that transformation. Mehmet Ozaseki, thank you so much. Çok teşekkürler. It's been one year since Donald Trump took the oath of office as the 45th president of the United States. And it's been the controversial year, to say the least, with his frequent outbursts on Twitter and what is often called unpresidential behavior. Meanwhile, U.S.-Turkey relations are at an all-time low. So how do people here in Istanbul feel about the Don's first year in office? Adil Halim couldn't get the real Trump to help him find out, but he got the next best thing in a segment we like to call Straight Up. Trump's first year in office has given Erhan Yezicioğlu plenty of material to work with. The Turkish actor impersonates Trump on stage and sometimes feels the wrath of the crowd. I appear on the stage and walk with this face for a minute, without speaking. Even this alone is enough to get on the audience's nerves. Hardly a day has passed where the real Trump isn't making headlines. His first year in office has been marred by high-profile spats. On the hit list, the media, you are fake news, the United Nations, we're taking names, and minorities. No, no, I'm not a racist. While some bonds have strengthened under Trump, Several others have fallen apart. Another one of the Trump administration's crumbling relationships is with Turkey. Ask Trump and he'll tell you he's the most successful president in history. But a recent Gallup poll says otherwise. His approval rating sits in the upper 30s. So we took to the streets of Istanbul to find out what Turks think about year one of the Trump presidency. The relations between two countries were better during the Obama administration. Trump only thinks of himself. He has always been like that. 
Other American presidents were saying Turkey is our ally, but they were lying. This man is openly saying that it's not. This is the only good side of him. I think that Trump doesn't govern the country. I think that Washington has been directing Trump. I can't put it only one word, but it has been a period of tension and it is very difficult to predict. He is against peace. Imagine a man who has everything, yet he is unappeasable. Trump campaigned on being a different kind of leader. And on that promise alone, like him or hate him, he delivered. And now the question is, how will he trump year one? Her şeyim vardı ve nihayet dünyanın da en büyük lideri oldum. İşte o kadar. Adı Halim, Straight Talk Istanbul. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with Nyali Mustafa. If you've got any comments or suggestions, do share them with us at hashtag Straight Talk and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye. Thank you.